Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This week's story is called Cabaret Confessions. It was written by no less than Stuff's podcast director, Adam Dudding, who joins me now. Hi, Adam. Hi, Michael. Uh, Before we get into the story and how it all came about, tell us about this cabaret that you were a part of. Well, for a little while, I played the piano not very well, i got to say, for a let's say drag queen or crossdresser or the, the, the term and the terms are quite flexible for various reasons. Um, a guy called Marcus Craig who performed as Diamond Lil and uh, Diamond Lil was a bit of a star back in the 70s TV show, used to do stuff with Billy T. James and Howard Morrison and other people. But um, I came on the scene in the early 90s by which time all that past glory was very much in the past. And Diamond Little was doing a very modest touring show that would play in the Cosy Clubs and RSAs all over the country. Right. So the story is, well, here's, it's sort of a first person account by you. And it sounds like it started as kind of a romp, like a a trip down memory lane, um, starring Adam Dudding as Liza Minnelli. But it took a pretty dark turn, as we'll hear. Tell us about all of that. <laughs> yeah. I, luckily for everyone, I didn't sing so the Liza Minnelli um, analogy breaks down pretty quickly. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was sort of a memoir piece um, and it was a bit of a, a, a roam trying to reconstruct, you know, a good 20 years after the fact, trying to reconstruct my memories of um, working with this guy. Um, and I knew that there were some slightly uh, – there were, there were stories about um, him not being an entirely upstanding citizen – but yeah, I went looking and went to the went to the library and and did a bit of research, found the cuttings, and yeah, discovered there were some prosecutions back when Diamond Lil was right at the height of her fame, um, where Marcus Craig was was accused of nefarious doings, and uh, yeah, so the story sort of took a bit of a turn at that point. So we should say this story is several years old. You wrote it 2016, 17, somewhere around there. It's now 2022. And you know, the way we reckon with sexual assaults, um, the way sexual predators are exposed has changed in recent years. Um, how, how did you feel when you revisited the story and read the story again? Yeah, it was kind of interesting. I mean, in terms of it being a, a five-year-old story, helpfully, Almost everything in the story happened at least 20 years before I wrote the story first time around. So um, everything was already in the past. So n- nothing much needed updating except the, you know, the numbers of, the, of years that had passed since certain events. Um, in actual fact, 2017, most of the things that are in our mind now when we think about the, the Me Too movement and also the uh, you know, powerful men laid low by revelations of bad things they've done, a lot of that was already in train. So you know, in the piece, as it stood... In 2017, there are references to Kevin Spacey and uh, Jimmy Savile and Rolf Harris and Bill Cosby. You know those kind of those kind of references. Um, if there was anything that did need updating, there were just a couple of references to uh, really sort of racist behaviour um, by Marcus uh, in an anecdote. And I just I just honed that down a little bit. Just um, I don't know if if readers are as keen to hear the racist words out loud in a way. So I just sort of slightly softened that in this version. So was what Marcus, who he was, he, he was relatively famous in his day, but was this other side of him known? Were you exposing him in what you found out here or was this all some sort of dark, dirty secret of New Zealand's Me Too movement that had never really been brought to light? I think really I didn't discover anything that wasn't known by someone already at some point. I guess, you know, rather than this, this being an investigation, I guess, if you want a big word for it, it was a recontextualization. I had a personal story which connected to a guy whose history was known and knowable and the articles were in the library. Um, but reading those old articles from the 70s and the 80s with fresh eyes, I did find a revelatory, I guess. It was, wow, okay. Things have moved on since the 70s and the 80s in the way we talk about sexual assault, the way we're talking about uh, the responsibility, you know, the way we blame victims and, and other things like that. 
All right, time to get into it. Thanks, Adam. Now, here is Adam reading his story, Cabaret Confessions. 31 years ago, not long after I'd left home and moved into a Ponsonby flat with paisley wallpaper and mice in the kitchen, a musician friend asked me if I was interested in taking over one of his regular gigs, playing piano for a drag queen. The drag queen's stage name was Diamond Lil, and his off-stage name was Marcus Craig. Both names rang a bell, but not very loudly. The friend set up an audition. The music was easy enough that I could muddle through, and my cover band's gig calendar wasn't exactly full. So a few weeks later, armed with an electronic piano and some bass and drum sequences for backing, I became the one-man orchestra of the Diamond Lil Show. Five months later... With little regret, I quit and got on a plane to London to begin my OE. The Diamond Lil Show was stand-up comedy with musical interludes in which a man dressed as a balloon-boobed Mae West character delivered double or single entendres in a deep, gravelly draw. Most of the jokes were based on the intrinsic hilariousness of the existence of sex, but these were leavened with brief forays into racism in the occasional rape or wife-beating gag. Lil's legs were superb, and her costumes extraordinary. There were knicker-skimming mini-dresses and grand, shiny frocks with plunging necklines, as well as fancy dress versions of a Wild West harlot, a Queen Victoria, and a mermaid, for which Marcus would waddle about in a tail and a vast pair of plastic comedy breasts. There were up to eight costume changes per show, and while Lil tussled with her zips off stage, Cabaret singers Valerie Rose and Chris Powley would entertain the audience with a repertoire that included It's a Long Way to Tipperary, Country Roads, Themes from the Muppets and Neighbours, and, for the grand entrance, Hello Dolly, only they sang it Hello Lily. All that music, that's why they needed a pianist. Back in the 1970s and 80s, I was told, Marcus Craig had been seriously famous on the New Zealand cabaret scene. He had been on TV, done telethons, performed alongside Billy T. James and Fred Dagg, and even though she wasn't the household name she'd once been, Lil still had a loyal, mostly middle-aged audience all over the country. Two or three nights a week, Marcus, Valerie, Chris and I would play to packed cosmopolitan clubs and RSAs and workingmen's clubs within striking distance of Auckland, and in December, we toured the entire country, starting in Invercargill and working back north. I was baffled by just about every aspect of the show, including why anyone would want to see it. But it was just one facet of a, an eventful year of new friends, flatmates, girlfriends, jobs and bands, and by the time I arrived at Heathrow, the memories were already starting to feel a little unreal. Did that really happen? After that, my diamond little days barely crossed my mind, unless I was in one of those competitive pub conversations where you compare weird, youthful jobs. Well, I once played backing piano in a Timaru RSA for a female impersonator with a drink problem. Then, in 2016, I published a book, a memoir which is mostly about my father, but also partly about me, and there's a passage where I summarised all the half-interesting things that had happened in my first 25 years, so alongside my stint as a double-glazing salesman and the time I had chicken pox but thought it was syphilis, I expended precisely 17 words on my adventures with Diamond Lil. A journalist interviewing me about the book said he remembered seeing Diamond Lil in the 1990s and asked me to expand on that a little. As I answered the journalist, memories started bubbling up. I remembered Marcus's grumpiness on tour and my own resentment as the songs and jokes grew over-familiar and the time of performance was interrupted by an attack of Marcus's kidney stones, and the time the tour van broke down. But most of my memories was gaps. I knew I'd learnt the music for dozens of songs, but apart from the modified Hello Dolly, I couldn't summon the names of any of them. I knew I'd worked with two singers alongside Marcus, but I couldn't remember Chris and Valerie's names. I distinctly recalled learning dozens of Marcus's one-liners and dirty jokes, yet... The only one I could remember was a fragment from a shaggy dog tale in which two people share a bed and lie back to back, quote, so they could put the wind up each other. I've always enjoyed a good fart-related joke. 
So I decided to see what more I could unearth. I couldn't talk to Marcus. He died in 2013. But there were newspaper cuttings and YouTube clips and people who'd known him well. With luck, there'd be enough in it for a newspaper article of my own. But what I learned turned out darker than I'd expected. The story of Diamond Lil was one of opera, despair and sex crimes, of mince pies and a car crash and cops who looked the other way. And it was also a kind of accidental history of a particular moment in New Zealand culture, with cameo appearances from Howard Morrison, John Clarke and noted theatre lover Sir Robert Muldoon. Apart from a couple of extinct phone numbers for Marcus and Chris in a 1991 appointment diary, I had no personal paper trail to jog my memory. No photos with the crew, no sheet music, no diary entries, no posters. I contacted my girlfriend of the time, Joelle, to ask if she could help me figure out some dates. And she Facebooked back saying she'd actually kept a diary that year. And on November the 3rd, 1991, I'd given her a free ticket to the Diamond Little Show at the East Coast Bay's RSA in Browns Bay on the North Shore. Her diary entry included a brief critique of the night's performance. She wrote, The show was dire, but the audience loved it. Adam sat behind the keyboard grinning, sometimes inanely, and I got bitched at by Marcus for not laughing enough. Joelle, who was English and was still learning about New Zealand culture, said she'd been struck by the audience overreacting to the sight of a guy in drag and that Marcus seemed to get increasingly angry as the night went on probably with me since the only free seat had been near the front and I must have put him off his game my next source was the musician friend who'd gifted me the gig in the first place he's asked me not to name him in this piece he played for Marcus for seven months or so including a South Island tour like me but where songs and jokes had slipped my mind they'd lodged firmly in his And when I rang him, it all came out in a cathartic rush. The Muppets theme opening number. The mermaid sketch. The genie in a lamp joke involving a wish for an enormous penis. Another joke where Superman sees Wonder Woman spread-eagled in a room on the 110th floor of a skyscraper in Metropolis and flies in to rape her, only to get a shock when he finds the Invisible Man is already at it. For days after we talked, this friend kept texting me gobbets of recovered memory. Thanks to you, I'm having Marcus Craig flashbacks. Hello Dolly, one of his big numbers, sung like the last gasps of a defective chainsaw. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. How about, I don't want to go to war, mum, I don't want to sabre up me kyber. This is so bad, I've buried this shit deep. Most usefully though, he reminded me of the names of the rest of the troop. Valerie Rose is probably still living on the shore, he said. And Chris Powley would be easy to find because he's performing all over the place. He's got a website. Pinning down an interview with Chris actually took a few months. He's a busy guy, often abroad on ritzy cruise ships. He's sick of the travel, but where else would he get to play packed 1,300 seaters with a 10-piece band every week? He's in his 40s and has looked after his voice. Chris was a core member of the Diamond Little Show troupe for nine years and one of Marcus's closest friends right until his death. At his home in Papakura, South Auckland, Chris had loads of old photos, including a blurry snap of me grinning inanely behind a keyboard, and a VHS of a Diamond Little Show recorded in 1994 that he could lend me. He also had Marcus's awards and show posters, and even some of the Diamond Little dresses. And this. In Chris's patio garden, there's a potted portakawa, and in the soil beneath, there's a box holding Marcus's ashes. Marcus Craig was born David Charles Leonard in 1940 in Adelaide, Australia. According to a biographical sketch by the Variety Artists Club of New Zealand, his father was a railwayman who died in an accident when David was about six, and his mother was an actor who toured with the Brisbane Opera Company. As a boy, he sang and played piano and appeared in school plays, and as a teenager, he worked in a music store before becoming an actor picked up theatre and TV roles and movie bit parts, including as a barman in the Mick Jagger movie Ned Kelly. 
According to press interviews, around 1964, he married a woman called Penny, and they had a daughter, Angela. Soon after that, Chris told me, Marcus discovered he was gay, and they separated. The VAC biography doesn't note the timing of the name change, but by the time he arrived in Auckland in 1970, David Leonard was Marcus Craig. He appeared in Mercury and Central Theatre Productions and stole the show in a long-running Victorian musical review where his roles included, quote, an unloved pantomime fairy, fat and 40-ish, unquote, who brought the house down. In 1975, with some nudging from the impresario Phil Warren, he developed the character of Diamond Lil as the MC and central drawcard of Warren's Dinner in a Show Cabaret, the Ace of Clubs. Quote, an allegedly sophisticated barn in Cook Street, unquote, as John Clark once described it, or the Ace of Crabs, as Marcus usually called it. Very suddenly, at 35, Marcus and Lil became household names. In interviews, Marcus said the idea wasn't to impersonate a female. Lil was a masculine, hairy-chested man unconvincingly pretending to be a, quote, 50-year-old mutton-dressed as lamb who simply adores sailors, unquote. Lil was not, he insisted, a drag queen. Whatever the definitions, audiences loved Lil. For season after season, she played to packed houses at the Ace, alongside established and emerging stars. Scripts were by Doug Aston, musical arrangements by Carl Doy, there were double bills with fellow luminaries Howard Morrison, Billy T. James, and John Clark's Fred Dagg. Of the Dagg Diamond double bill, Clark said later that, quote, what Marcus most wanted to do was sing opera, so he'd get the drag shtick working and then repay himself with an aria. A live album of the Fred Dagg season was made, and the single Gumboots made the top 20. Marcus shared his stage with Annie Whittle, Tina Cross, Ray Wolfe, Rob Guest, Derek Payne, David McPhail, and John Gadsby, and visiting international stars. There was a TV comedy series. He did telethons. Prime Minister Rob Muldoon was a fan. In 1979, Marcus told the Auckland Star that, quote, Mr and Mrs Muldoon have been several times. He has even asked my permission to use some of my jokes in his own speeches. Then, in 1983... After 10 years and thousands of performances as Lil, Marcus left for Australia, saying he needed a break. He had a retail job at a sex shop in King's Cross, Sydney, but intermittently dusted off the frocks for returns to New Zealand, including another telethon and a wildly successful season at the Ace of Clubs in 1985, a last hurrah before it was demolished to make way for the Aotea Centre. With the Ace in rubble, the Diamond Lil show hit the road. In 1988, Marcus was based back in Auckland, and Valerie and Chris were the two permanent members of the touring show. The touring show that I would stumble into three years later, in 1991. Chris Powley was 14, and a year off leaving school when he auditioned to be Diamond Lil's singer in 1988. A child singing prodigy, he had been in showbiz since 11, mentored by Lou Clawson of the 1960s comedy music duo Lou and Simon. Chris remembers Marcus with affection but no illusions. There was the drinking, the sulking, the tantrums. There was the fast turnover of pianists like me. I was always surprised with anyone who lasted longer than a week, Chris told me. Chris stuck with it because the pay was decent, and he liked Marcus, and he enjoyed the show, even if he was initially too innocent to get all the jokes, like when the doctor asks Lil how often she has sex, and she replies infrequently, and the doctor says, is that one word or two? Chris never quite knew how much to believe, of the stories Marcus told about his past. He claimed he was close friends with British comedian Dick Emery and with John Inman from Are You Being Served and that he'd once sung with Luciano Pavarotti who had also been his flatmate. There was an old vinyl disc with no label that Marcus used to play of an impressive sounding opera tenor which Marcus said was a recording of himself. He told Chris he'd got cancer of the vocal cords in his late 20s and that buggered his voice up and left him as Chris put it, with that rough, hello dears, how are ya, sort of thing. All of these claims about famous friends and recording sessions could be true, said Chris, but Marcus was a bullshitter. Chris was looking very well, 
He'd filled out a bit from the rake-thin teenager I used to kill time with in a motel room in Timaru or Cambridge or Blenheim, but his voice, rich and smoky and with something of the vibrato of his idol Howard Morrison, was still the same. As Chris talked to me about life with Marcus, more of my own memories swam into focus. I started to remember how Marcus would break into snatches of aria in a tuneful falsetto or casually play a really difficult Mozart piano piece. I remembered that he used to wee into a bucket of water at half time and use the urine enhanced water to wash his face before redoing his stage makeup for the second half. And that he liked crosswords and TV quiz shows for which he always knew every answer. I remembered noticing that beneath his habitual glower, Marcus was taking everything in. I remembered squeezing into the white van with a trailer behind full of frocks and fake breasts and Marcus at the wheel, driving atrociously. At every hill intersection, he'd ride the clutch for minutes rather than use the handbrake and you could smell and hear the van's insides grinding towards extinction. Valerie discovered years later that Marcus had never actually had a driver's license. I had injured my lower back a couple of years earlier, carrying speakers while in a short-lived rock band, and so by the end of the day-long drives of our South Island tour, I'd be in agony, and I remembered my fury when Marcus yelled at me to sit properly in my seat rather than lying on the van's floor, which is where I wanted to be. I remembered walking around in Vicargo with Chris, wondering what people did there. I remembered sitting in a beer-smelling RSA, bashing out the chords to Old MacDonald, which was always our most popular song. I remembered laughing genuinely at Lil's lip-smacking and groin grinds and eye rolls and word plays and penis jokes the first time I witnessed them, then chuckling the second time, then weakly smiling the third, and from then on feeling acutely aware as I perched behind my keyboard stand on the side of the stage that the audience could see my face as it alternated between stony-faced boredom and a rictus of faked amusement. Before I'd started as Diamond Lil's pianist, my musician friend had mentioned that Marcus had once been up in court, charged with sex offences against an underage boy, but he'd got off, and there had been doubts about the accuser's claims. He'd also warned me that Marcus had an appetite for vodka, and could get through two bottles during a single show. Apparently it had little effect on his performance, but after the final number, he'd turn nasty and look for someone to argue with. In fact, I was spared the alcohol-related horrors because in Petoni, a few weeks before I started, Marcus had collapsed to the floor mid-joke, bringing the performance to a halt. Chris took him to hospital where they said his kidneys were failing and if he didn't stop drinking, he'd die. From that day on, said Chris, Marcus did lay off the vodka, though he'd still have the odd glass of wine. Chris said Marcus always insisted on driving the van after gigs, no matter how drunk, and if he was pulled over while weaving down the road, which happened more than once, he'd turn on the diamond little charm for the cops. Hello mates, how are ya? And be sent on his way. Chris said there were times when we shouldn't have made it home. He rolled the car once, drunk, and still had his pie in his hand at the end. He'd always say, don't eat McDonald's, don't eat pies and all that crap, but after a gig, when he was drunk, he'd always have a pie or McDonald's in his hand. And the next day, he'd deny eating it. Marcus Drunk could be a nasty, horrible man, said Chris. Once, after a show at the Lower Hut Cozy Club, Marcus started bad-mouthing Chris's parents, and Chris saw red. I bailed him up against the wall and told him to pretty much F off and get out of my life. By morning, Marx had forgotten all about it and was mystified when his other singer, Valerie, told him that Chris had upped and left for Auckland, mid-tour. There were a couple more similar bust-ups over the years and each time, Marcus would grovel and Chris would come back. Chris said that's because Marcus had this beautiful side to him, a heart of gold. He'd give you the shirt off his back to help you, but then he could turn, a Jekyll and Hyde sort of thing. He was a joy to work with after he'd stopped drinking. Vodka infused or not, Marcus's kidneys still weren't in great shape when I joined the show. At half time of a gig in Mount Monganui, he suddenly lay on the floor and started groaning. A doctor was summoned to give him an injection for what I now presume was kidney stones, and Chris, Valerie and I treated the audience to some extra songs to kill time 
until Marcus lurched back on stage to thunderous applause. When I quit in early 1992 and headed off on my OE, the Diamond Little Show already felt like it was near the end. A slowly closing window into the popular culture of 1970s New Zealand performed by an ailing, unhappy old man. Marcus was, in fact, only 52, but I was only 21, so I didn't have a good handle on ages yet. Yet, the show kept touring steadily for another two years after I left, and there were occasional reunion tours for almost a decade after that. The regular tours ended because Marcus's other permanent singer, Valerie Rose, had a baby daughter and grew sick of Marcus's lack of consideration around that. The last straw was after a Rotorua gig, where she didn't get back through her own front door in Auckland until 4am, breasts leaking milk to a hungry baby. She told me that after she'd pulled the plug, Marcus didn't have the heart to start from scratch with a new singer. He returned to Australia once more, and it remained his base for the rest of his life. I visited Valerie in Browns Bay, where she lives with her husband and daughter and runs a dog grooming company called Barking Mad. Born in London, Valerie came to New Zealand as a teenager. She first met Marcus when he and Billy T. James were judges on one of the many TV talent quests she entered in the 1970s. I always remember Billy T. saying, you exude a warmth that's outstanding. And Marcus said, oh, you picked a difficult song, but I love the dress. When she auditioned for Marcus's post Ace of Clubs touring troupe in 1985, he remembered her. I loved your dress. And she was given a week to learn a two-hour show. In all, she worked with Marcus for 15 years, though for much of that time she also had a well-paid day job with Telecom. Like Chris, Valerie had fond memories of a flawed friend, someone who was ferociously bright, often kind and generous with money, someone with real musical talent and superb comic timing, someone who could be self-absorbed and grouchy when sober and vile when drunk. Marcus could organise a show, said Valerie. But he was clueless about business and reckless with money. He accumulated no wealth despite those successful years at the Acer Clubs. In the early 90s, his phone was cut off for non-payment. And when she visited his Beach Haven rental, she found empty cupboards and more unpaid bills. She stocked the pantry, paid his debts, and told him to pull himself together. She reminded me that when Marcus's van broke down when I was with them in Gore, as I remember it, the much-abused clutch finally burnt out, she bailed him out once more. He didn't have any money, so Chris and I bought a van because it was the only way we could get home. It was about six grand and he paid me off $20 extra per gig. For all that, though, working with Marcus was great fun. Especially on stage. He'd veer off script and they'd have to scramble to keep up. Like the time when Valerie was visibly pregnant and they were doing an outer space sketch set amid the rings of Saturn. Valerie recalled, One of my lines was, Something was in the air that night, and Marcus turned around and said, Yes, look at you, your legs. And all of a sudden, the whole sketch started changing. Off stage, he could surprise in less pleasant ways, like when they were in Waitangi and decided to take the touristic cream trip island cruise on a day off. The boat was just about to cast off when Marcus suddenly scuttled ashore. When they got back, he was sitting by the hotel pool, red as a lobster. When Valerie asked why he'd jumped ship, he told her, he hadn't wanted to spend the day with all these Chinese tourists, though his phrasing was a lot more racist than that. Marcus was also pretty racist about Polynesians, Valerie said. In fact, Marcus's misanthropy was a broad church. He had a little hate for women going on, said Chris. He'd make an example of women who yelled out in the show and say, you're the reason there are so many gay men in the world. Marcus was Open and comfortably gay, said Chris, with gay friends and some long-term relationships in New Zealand and Australia. Yet he would sneer about what he called lispy gays. He preferred those where it wasn't easy to tell. Valerie remembered playing a couple of gay clubs in Wellington, but I don't think Marcus felt in his comfort zone. They wanted us to come back, but he wasn't interested. Marcus wouldn't have been seen dead near a gay pride event, she said, and he hated queens the ones that portray themselves as women and walk along K Road. He didn't like people dressing up as a female if they weren't female. He was, said Valerie, a complicated man. Before meeting Chris and Valerie, I visited Auckland Public Library and copied all the Marcus Craig newspaper cuttings I could find. 
Their enthusiastic reviews of his Ace of Clubs shows and profiles of the rising 1970s star. His departures and returns from Australia were logged in the celebrity gossip columns. And there was a lovely interview by reporter Terry Snow, where he dragged Marcus away from the in-character double entendres to talk seriously about his love and knowledge of opera. One short article from 1991 plugged a charity matinee at the Aotea Centre from the time when I'd been Diamond Little's pianist. I'd pretty much forgotten all about it, but once again the memories swam back into view. I remembered that one of the other performers was the Australian entertainer Barry Crocker, singer of the original Neighbours theme. Crocker impressed me backstage by telling me the Neighbours royalties still earned him $100 beer money a week. He also showed me how his autograph contained a caricature of his own face, a trick he'd been taught by Rolf Harris. As I'd hoped, the library also had cuttings about Marcus's sexual assault trial of 1988. This was the case that my musician friend had mentioned before I took over the piano gig from him. The Auckland Star reported that a jury at Auckland High Court had found Marcus Craig not guilty of three indecency charges relating to an incident one afternoon at Marcus's Beach Haven home. The charges were assault with intent to commit sexual violation, unlawful sexual connection and indecent assault on a 14-year-old boy. The defence successfully argued that Craig would have had little or no time between a hairdresser's appointment in Papakura that afternoon and a television rehearsal later to commit the alleged indecencies. The defence also suggested that the boy, who had previously done odd jobs around his home, had made up the allegations because Marcus had caught him stealing. OK, not guilty then. What I hadn't expected to find, though, was another set of clippings from 1977, at which time Marcus was really at the peak of his fame. According to The Star, The Herald and the Saturday sports tabloid 8 O'Clock, Marcus had faced an uncannily similar set of sexual assault charges 11 years before the case I'd gone looking for. Marcus Craig stood trial at the Supreme Court in Auckland, accused of two charges, performing an indecent act on a 13-year-old boy and allowing the youth to perform an indecent act on him. In evidence, Marcus said he'd never seen the boy before and described the allegations made against him as, quote, filthy lies. Yet Marcus's defence had one enormous hurdle to overcome. When police first put the accusations to him, he had given a signed statement admitting he had indeed behaved indecently with a, quote, youngish, unquote, chap he met in the city and took to his Mount Eden home. That's where things get truly bizarre. I'll quote from the Herald report of Marcus's court evidence. When he made his statement to Mr. Farrand, he said he was in a state of mental and physical exhaustion. He'd been working up to 80 hours a week before the interview, in addition to taking part in the telethon appeal two days earlier. He said he was horrified when told of the accusations, but did not think, because of his theatrical work, that he would be believed if he denied them. I said yes to everything to get out of the police station, he said. I suppose I basically became Diamond Little for a while. I was just acting. I just wanted to get out of there. Craig said he saw his statement again several days later and was shattered. Craig's doctor, Dr. R. A. Roche, said he believed there were times when Craig was acting without knowing it. Another report said Marcus had taken two Valium tablets before going to the police station and was, quote, completely and utterly exhausted both mentally and physically, end quote. On October the 13th, 1977, the Herald report of the verdict records that in his summing up, Mr Justice Bain said he had to warn the jury that in sexual cases it was dangerous to act on the uncorroborated evidence of the person on whom it was alleged the indecency had been perpetrated. The article noted that Mr Justice Bain said the youth was capable of some untruths. The jury of six women and six men took nearly five hours to reach a verdict. Not guilty on both charges. Based on nothing more than these news cuttings, which tell us that a famous entertainer walked free after claiming an initial written confession of child sexual assault was in fact a piece of accidental cabaret, you have to at least consider the possibility 
that Marcus was in fact guilty as hell. And given the five-hour deliberation, you have to presume some of the jury had similar feelings. Then, add the knowledge that a decade later, Marcus would face near-identical charges concerning a boy of similar age. Think, too, about the status of Marcus Craig in 1977. Photos with the Prime Minister, telethon appearances, a hit cabaret show. Think of that warning to the jury about the dangers of uncorroborated abuse claims. And think perhaps about more recent cases and what we've learned about Rolf Harris and Jimmy Savile and Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey and how blind eyes are turned on the predatory behaviour of famous men. Listen to the familiar ring of this quote from Marcus's employer, Phil Warren, after Marcus's 1977 not guilty verdict, when he told the 8 o'clock that in his 25 years in the entertainment industry, he had many times heard of public names having allegations made against them. It happens to entertainers, politicians and anyone in the public eye, Warren said. I haven't escaped myself. I'm aware that some impressionable people fantasise. I asked both Chris and Valerie what they knew about the court cases. At the time of the 1988 trial, Chris had accepted Marcus's protestations that it was a false accusation, especially seeing it seemed that the logistics of it meant the offending couldn't have happened when the boys said it had. Chris knew nothing about the 1977 trial, though. After all, he was three at the time. But when I spelt out the flimsy-sounding defence and asked if he thought Marcus could have been guilty, he said, it wouldn't surprise me, because he liked young guys. Chris never knew of, nor suspected, anything involving anyone underage. But in Australia, in his 60s, Marx had a really serious relationship with a guy in his early 20s. Chris himself was 14 when he joined the Diamond Little Show. Did Marx ever hit on him? No, said Chris. I was super confident and knew who I was. I think he was too wise to make any advance towards me. Valerie, too, knew nothing about the 1977 trial. But at the time of the 1988 trial, she asked Marcus directly if he was guilty. I said, look Marcus, it's got nothing to do with me, apart from the fact that if you get put inside I'm out of a job, your sexual preferences have nothing to do with me, but did you? Because there's no smoke without fire. Valerie said, and he said, there shouldn't be any smoke. He never said yes, he never said no, Valerie said. He just turned around and said, there isn't any smoke. When I watched Chris's video of a 1994 Diamond Little show, I recognised all the songs and jokes. They hadn't changed since I was on the piano. They never, ever changed. The Ace of Clubs scripts, mostly by Doug Aston, but with borrowings from the likes of Dick Emery and Danny LaRue, were recycled for decades. Marcus was a nimble ad-libber, but he had no interest in updating his material. Valerie told me, he said, why fix what's not broken? But I think it was because he wasn't actually the writer, and after he left the ace, he stagnated. Chris put it this way. When Phil Warren said to Marcus, I want you to jump into a dress and tell jokes, Marcus was like, forget it, that's not me, I want to be a singer. But when he saw how successful it was, and how much money it brought in, he thought, oh, I can't be all that bad, and continued it, and lent on it, and then depended on it. There was a lot of deep-rooted anger there. He was successful, but not by being who he wanted to be. Being the character of Diamond Lil, he hated it. He succumbed to the fact that that was all he had, and that was all he was going to have. There were no efforts from him to be anything other, not even to get new jokes. After leaving for Australia in 1994, Marcus never lived permanently in New Zealand again, despite the intermittent revivals. Neither Chris nor Valerie could understand why he stayed in Australia, given that all his friends and career and successes were here. He lived in Sydney, then Brisbane, then the Sunshine Coast. For a time he worked at a Brisbane record store where he was the opera expert. And that led to an unpaid spot on a community access classical station in Brisbane where, twice a week, he'd rave brilliantly about opera and play his favourites. Even after all the gigs ended, Chris and Valerie stayed in touch and both said Marcus seemed sad. 
I always phoned him on his birthday, said Valerie, and it was always, oh, you remembered. You could tell he was getting old and probably down in the dumps and fed up. Chris would always visit if his work took him to Australia. A few months before Christmas 2012, he rang Marcus. He was talking about dying. I don't have much to live for anymore, and I just want to die. Chris invited Marcus over to Auckland for Christmas, offering the fare when Marcus said he couldn't afford it, but then had to cancel when a cruise ship gig was extended over Christmas. I felt a bit stink about it. I had to ring up Marcus and say, I'm not going to be home, sorry mate. It wasn't long after that that he died. On August the 10th, 2013, the diabetic, lifelong smoker and one-time hard drinker had a massive coughing fit while in front of the TV in his flat, burst a blood vessel in his lungs and drowned in his own blood. He was 73. When Marcus didn't turn up for a regular Sunday coffee, a neighbour found the body. There was no next of kin to be found, but Chris's number was the most frequently dialed in Marcus's phone. Chris flew to the Sunshine Coast to tidy up Marcus's affairs. He looked around the tiny pensioner flat and thought, how did you end up here? How did you go from being where you were in New Zealand to being in this little 4x3 death cabin? Marcus had no money, no real assets. All his things had already gone to a charity shop, including a large collection of opera records. I was gutted, said Chris, because there were things I'd have liked to have had, like a jewellery box that I made out of timber at school for Marcus, and a ruby ring that Danny LaRue gave him that he treasured. Chris placed newspaper ads seeking family members, but no one responded. So he arranged the cremation, hid the ashes in his suitcase, and brought Marcus back to New Zealand, his second and true home. He and the Variety Artists Club organised a memorial at the Bays Club in Browns Bay, a frequent Diamond Lil venue. Valerie sang, Thank you for being a friend. I rang the Brisbane community radio station where Marcus had his weekly opera show until 2009. General Manager Gary Thorpe said he first knew Marcus as the opera expert at a city record store who would make extremely assertive recommendations about which CDs 4MBS Classic FM should review next. He'd also bump into Marcus at the opera. Eventually, Thorpe invited Marcus to share his strong views and deep knowledge with his listeners. Marcus was cautious, but once behind the microphone, he was a natural. He was a very entertaining broadcaster, said Thorpe. He was genuine in his enthusiasm and very scathing about the singers he didn't feel could do it, but in a way where you couldn't take offence. It came from a deep love of the art form. Later, Thorpe saw that Marcus was struggling, but proud. His journey to the studio involved three buses, and when failing health made that impractical, Thorpe offered to pay for a cab each time, but Marcus refused, saying he didn't want to put anyone out. Thorpe had no inkling whatsoever of Marcus's former life and New Zealand fame. But there was this one thing Marcus would do occasionally that would mystify him. He'd be talking to Marcus, especially in the record store, and Marcus would fall back into a character, firing off a caustic remark about a singer. But I never knew what that character was. Then, when Thorpe went to the wake in Australia, there was a screen playing clips of Marcus wearing a series of bright frocks, stalking the stage and grinding out the smutty jokes. Thorpe was stunned to realise that his opera friend Marcus had once been a performer, a drag queen, no less. It turned out that the flamboyant, deep-voiced character who would occasionally take possession of Marcus actually had a name. Diamond. Lil. That was Cabaret Confessions on the long read from Stuff, written and read by Adam Dudding and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was edited by Sam Scannell. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listen to via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on the Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening.